No, I work at Mars Fish Care, um, and I thought I'd share a little bit about what I do and where I was. So the last meeting, I wasn't here. I was at our other facility in England. So we have a research facility here in Chalfont and one in England. So I thought I'd share some things from that. You know our products. Uh, we've been around about 50 years. Started by Alan Joel. Mars uh, bought us about 12 years ago. And we've been with Mars now for 12 years. And that's where Mars Fish Care comes from. This is the team I work with. Uh, this is the Chalfont team. That's my team in England. Uh, Tim, Donna, and Lewis. And uh, Donna and Tim are PhD. Uh, Donna's uh, PhDs in fish nutrition, and Tim just got his PhD, and t you'll see here a little more about, um, I'm sorry, Lewis just got his PhD, and Tim's working on his. So in Shelfont, we have a, a full lab. We do product development. We do analytical work for production. We do research work, etc. We have a really cool fish room. Um, the fish room is about twice the size of when it was acquiring pharmaceuticals. The floors were excavated, dug out, so they're pitched with a center drain. So when I spill water, it goes to the drain. When I drain a tank, it goes to the drain. The walls are plastic, and they're epoxied to the floor. So again, I can take a hose, squirt the entire thing right here. The epoxy from the floor goes up right to the wall, and they're all epoxied together. Um, so it's really a pretty nice outfit. All the tanks you'll notice on the racks are in tr threes, and that's for statistics. So when we're doing studies, we can have significant studies. Now, as a um, biologist or as a professional in the aquatic world for teaching, significance means statistics. So I need at least replicates of three of anything I do. If I want to power it up, get higher statistics, I can do four or five, et cetera. So all the racks are done in whatever I do in three. So I could have our product, an advanced, uh, something we want to do that's changing something, competitive product, et cetera. In England, we have the Waltham facility. The Waltham facility uh, has about 200 people working there every day. And I'll say the majority of the work there is dog and cat. So when you think of Mars, there's five companion animals, bird, cat, dog, fish, and horse. So fish is a small part, but they're the five companion animals. What's cool is we get the benefit, as fish care being real small, to work in some of the labs. Um, when I was over there, I spent a fair amount of time in this lab here uh, as Lewis is working on some testing for ammonia nitrite removal and challenging stuff and things of that sort. So we do all kinds of things from tissue cultures and things of this sort over there. We don't do tissue cultures here in Chalfont, but we do in England. Um, really neat facilities. All this, the back aquarium products. So this is the facility here. Uh, we have another facility in uh, Tennessee, which is called the GIC, the Global Innovation Center. Neat facility, but it's not really that great because it doesn't have fish. So, no, it's a, uh, I think we spent 64 or 65 million building the facility, but it's all about dog and cats. So the Morris family takes all the work for these five pets, again, dog, cat, bird, fish, and horse, very seriously. And we're a non-invasive, so uh, we're extremely friendly to the, in, the, in the way we do things. So when you hear me talk about things, you'll, you'll understand this is the fish room in um, England. It's actually smaller than the one in Chalfont, so I always get told about that. You'll see the seahorse in the center, and the reason the seahorse is in the center is that's the hippocampus barbari. It's an endangered species. The only place you can legally buy that is from the islands of body in the Philippines, which the Morris family has developed. Lewis spent, oh, a long time over there. Tim and Don have been over. I got the privilege of going over last year, um, and we work with the islanders over there and teach them how to raise it. And what we're doing is stopping them from destroying the reef, stopping them from harvesting these animals from the wild to put them back into our hobby. And the Morris family spent a large number of years with a gentleman named Joel, uh, Noel Janitsky and uh, Cy Paul and others over there to get CITES to approve the sale of that into ornamentals. And that, that seahorse is now available in the US and in Europe because of that. Um, we also work a lot with uh, 
Clownfish, again, we do a lot of live foods and things like that, transferring that knowledge back to the islanders, all in the name of sustainability. So awful lot's done, so when you're thinking Mars Fish Care, you're thinking API, think the Mars family, think about all the work they do for the environment. We have a um, slogan in Mars called SIG, Sustainable in a Generation. Uh, we were supposed to be there by 2020. We're not going to be there by 2020. But Chalfont's a landfill-free facility. Uh, all of our lights now are moving over to LEDs. I just went through a, a five-year capital meeting today talking about solar panels and things of this sort to be even more and more and more sustainable. Um, and all this science that we do goes to the work, and we, we have a term, proof through science, or uh, proven scientific solutions. So we, we actually provide the science and everything I'm going to talk about tonight, you have a question, you want to know something, challenge me, ask me, I'll tell you where the science comes from. I'll tell you what the protocols were. I'll be able to tell you, uh, we do sheets like this all the time. So we do what our introduction was. We do what the research was about. We give the results, and then we give a conclusion. We're very outgoing and very upfront about the work we do. So when I mention things that talk about products, there's science behind them. And I challenge other companies to do that. And I know that they're just not out there, so we're, we're really happy with that type work. Um, this is just an example, introduction, aim, methods, and results. And this was growing uh, different plants under a CO2 booster against the top competitor and against, of course, the control. Uh, our vision is about helping people easily enjoy their own underwater world. So it says a lot. Um, and we try and make it simple, we try and make it easy, enjoyable, and it's about ponds and aquariums. We only work on ornamental fish. We don't work on food fish. We just work on aquariums and ponds. So I was tapped on the shoulder the other day to say, hey, can you throw something together? And I did. I literally threw this together. So I have not given this talk before. I just threw it together. It's bits and pieces, of course from other things. I don't invent new biology or new science, so what I'm telling you is something I would have said all along, but how to evaluate and understand fish health. And I get asked a lot about fish health. And I want to preface the fact, it's not about treating fish for disease, but it's about how are you evaluating your fish, how are you evaluating your aquarium to see if it's healthy. So the disease part's easy. You know, and we'll talk about bacterial, fungal, viral, and parasitic diseases in a small section of this. But look at the rest of it. This is your aquarium. And the key here is when I look at fish, you know, we have to know about the type of fish, how densely packed they are in the aquarium. Nutrition is probably one of the biggest killers of fish or biggest problems that people have issues with fish. It's not because the fish isn't eating the food. It's not because the fish isn't growing. It's not doing it in a healthy manner. We'll talk a little bit about that. Genetics certainly play a role. The stressful side of things is the biggest part of the killer in fish is really comes down to water quality. So we'll cover that a little bit as well. But I can have a stressful condition with fish and kill them without having any parasites or any, any true disease. And I define disease as the fish's inability to maintain normal physiological functions. Break the word down, dis-ease, it's uncomfortable. That doesn't mean it has a parasite, it doesn't mean it has a bacterial infection, it's just dis-ease. And we'll cover that, but the majority of it's environmental. So first thing is when we're looking at our fish, when we're buying fish, when we're keeping fish, I'm an advocate to say, go back and learn where that fish came from. Use your books, use your magazines, ask other members. See where it came from. You know, we look at some of the Amazonian fish, and I had the privilege of going up the Rio Negro a couple years ago, and the water there was 2.9 pH. 2.9. Now you think, okay, that's a rarity. No, the whole Rio, most of the Rio Negro was that way. Now, the Amazon's 6.5, but you know if you're getting a fish up the Rio Negro, and it's coming out of that water, and it's coming from the wild, and it's coming into the wholesaler, and it's getting the pet shop, and you're bringing it here, and our water's 7.5, and wondering why the fish is shocky, and the fish has been raised 
evolved through eons or generations anyway at this low pH, and you're wondering why it won't breed. Second point is, at a 2.9 or a 3.5 or a 4.0 or even a 5.5 pH, there's not a lot of bacteria there for it to fight against. So that's fish's immune systems are different. If we're looking at African cichlids, remember an African cichlids can be anywhere from the high 7s and 8s up to the 9s. You don't think of African cichlids at 9.0. So if we learn where they're environmentally from and we can look at that, we're going to be better aquarists, and we're going to get healthier fish. I put paradise fish out in my ponds this year. I gave a bunch away. I just took about 50 into work. They're all in now, just a short. I took them all in the other week. Paradise fish are one of the, the garami, the paradise garami, one of the first fish ornamentally brought into our hobby in the 1850s in England. That's why I love this fish. It represents our first ornamental fish brought into the hobby. Uh, but it's a cold water fish. It's great for outdoor ponds. It survives in a warm aquarium, but it thrives in cooler water. White cloud, minnows, same thing. Survives in your aquarium in warm water, thrives in cooler water. So if we learn where they are environmentally, we're going to learn a lot about them. We can look at the water quality. Male-female ratios. A lot of, oh, sorry, it's spelled wrong. Male-female ratios Something in the old books, they always told us how many males to females or females to males to keep together for proper population. Today, we think male-female. No, there's a male-female ratio that works best for keeping them. Food preference, we'll talk a little in understanding the life cycle. How long does that fish live? I can keep guppies alive for years and years and years. In the wild, they're only going to be about two years, two and a half years old max. I get a guppy really old, she is going to get egg bound. Her belly is going to extend. She's not going to continue to breed. You're not doing anything wrong. If that fish is only used to being environmentally at two or three years old, we're keeping it four or five in the aquarium, we have to expect those things. So a lot of times we want to say, what did we do wrong? We have a lifetime member, um, uh, Ed Cook who kept a iridescent shark. His iridescent shark was about 24 or 25 years old. He called me up and he asked me a question because it died. Ed called me up and, I'm, and he's like, Gary, do you think I did right by this fish? Think about that statement, how much he cared for the fish. So once we get the fish, simple questions. What animal are we keeping? And this goes for corals or fish or anything of the sort. Where is it from in nature? What is the correct water conditions? And it's not just one or two, but list them out. What food is best for the fish to thrive? Not just survive, but thrive. And what would be the ideal captive environment for it? Is it a rocky cove? Is it a... No fish should be in a glass bottom tank, and no fish should be by itself. Fish don't live in a solitary condition their whole life. It just doesn't happen. But there's times we do that, for breeding or whatever, but if we're going to keep a fish proper or any animal proper, we want to look at, you know, what's their creature comforts? What's the right environment? We're all dealing with one thing, and that's tap water. I don't care where you live. You got to do water source of some sort, whether it's a well, whether it's municipal water source or whatever the case may be, we have to consider what's in the tap. You have to consider your tap polluted. It's not natural. The water we're using today is the same water the dinosaurs drank. Yes, you're using dinosaur pee to fill your tanks. The difference is today we're cycling the water faster and faster through Earth, and we're putting more and more pressure because of how tightly packed we are in our homes and how many people are using the water and how much we're using water. So whether it's agricultural infiltration, whether it's just water usage, or whatever, lack of mangroves, loss of environment, etc. we're putting more pressure on the water, so our water today is worse. Second point, chlorine and chloramines. We only have a few municipalities in the United States that use chlorine dioxide, more common in Europe, but chlorine and chloramines. Years ago, it used to be very low, 0 0.5, 1.0 part per million. Because of bioterrorism, it's now at 4.0 parts per million. The chlorine and chloramine levels in our tap water is there for our health. It stops 
cryptosporidium, uh, malaria, um, all the different problems that we would have. We can drink our water anywhere in the United States and be totally safe. It's great for us, it's bad for our fish. Heavy metals, all water has metals, small trace amounts. When you fill your aquarium, first time, you probably don't have enough metals to worry about. But when water evaporates out of your aquarium, and you top it off, and it evaporates and top it off, you're increasing the metals. Thus, those trace metals, which were essential, now become accumulated called heavy. Heavy metals can be toxic to fish. We can take care of those easily. We'll talk a little more about electrolytes and pH, water hardness. But there's one thing there, pollutants. What else is in your water? If you live in Langhorne, you're going to have super high iron. You're going to grow plants like it's going out of this world. I know that because I've done enough tanks and put tanks in people's homes or you see the red in the water. So everybody's water can be accommodated to certain fish or you can filter your water accordingly. Um, if you have chlorine, you fill your tank 12 to 72 hours, it's gone. It's evaporated, dissipated out. If you have chloramines, you could be there a week or two later. Small amounts are going to irritate fish. Large amounts are going to kill. So even topping the tank off at 5 or 10% is like you getting a scratch. You'll heal, no question. Do it again tomorrow and again the next day, and eventually you'll get scar tissue or a bacterial infection from it. So if any time you're filling your tank with tap water, whether it be a well, whether it be from the immiscible source, water conditioners are inexpensive, and best thing you can do for your fish. Talked about metals. Um, remember, they accumulate over time. That's why we do water exchanges. You're going to see me. The solution to pollution is dilution. Water change, water change, water change. So the solution to pollution is dilution. Keep that in your head. Nothing better than a water change. Now, I do jump up and down about a few products, stress copying one. It's the only product on the market proven to heal tissue. It's the only product on the market now proven for slime coat. And that's really where it's at. So it takes care of chlorine and chloramines. All water conditioners do that. Stress coat does it instantly. The other guy does it spontaneously. And we all do it at the same speed. The minute you put any water conditioner into your tank, the chlorine and chloramine is gone. Because whether they're using sodium thiosulfate or sodium sulfoxalate or sodium biosulfate, I don't care what they're using. They all take care of chlorine and chloramines at the same level. So those are easy. But it's that next part. If you want to enhance the slime coat, if you want to help protect your fish, reducing stress, healing tissue, promoting slime. So if you really care about your fish, you're going to look at stress coat. So evaluating, understanding a healthy environment. What's good water quality? I get asked it all the time. That is a question you cannot answer until you know what fish you're looking at. What's the right pH? You know, I get people to call me and they have problems with their tank and I'm like, have you tested your water? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. What were the readings? Oh, they were good. What were the levels? They were all zero. What was your pH? Oh, it was zero. You know, I get those answers every now and then, you know, because they don't test. The only way you're going to know water quality is to test it. What you test for will depend on what you're doing. Most times, you don't have to worry about nitrate and phosphate if you're keeping fish. Actually, if the phosphate is zero in your tanks, your bacteria won't function. Your plants won't survive. Too much nitrates and phosphates, yes, it can cause algae. If we're in a reef tank and I have uh, too much phosphate, I can precipitate out my calcium. There's all kinds of interplay chemistry-wise. And I have oxygen down there. If you have a water pump and you're splashing or circulating the surface, if you have an air pump, you have enough dissolved oxygen. Um, unless you're keeping labyrinth fish, such as bettas or garamis or such, um, which are, can actually breathe some air, um, Fish need oxygen, so that's a given. Just circulate the water. When we look at uh, testing water, this is primarily the starting points in some aspects of what you have to think about, temperature, pH, and I'll put KH up there, and we'll talk about KH and GH, ammonia, nitrite, salt, 
oxygen again, and tap water safety. So temperature. The key thing here is nothing happens in your tank, breeding-wise or whatever, that's not affected by temperature. Certain plants you keep are going to function better at temperature. You know, certainly our cold water fish, they can go up and down all over the place. Tropical fish, being salt water or fresh water, tropical, warm water, don't have as wide a range. But depending on where the fish are coming from, what part of the world they're coming from, that's going to tell you the range they can take. And most of the fish that we're getting in our hobby are coming from rainforest. You don't think about that, except for, of course, African cichlids. But a lot of the fish are coming from extremely warm climates. And some of those fish won't breed until it's extremely warm. Or some of the fish will not breed until you do a water change or a major temperature change. And I can get fish to breed that just people are having trouble just by doing a major temperature change. Either a water change or chilling it down or doing things that way. Every year I'll put garamis or something outside. I've been and I put them outside in the spring. They're going to breed because of temperature change. I'm not doing anything special. This year I put the paradise fish out and within days they were building bubble nests. Beautiful batch of bubble nests. Then I had a torrential downpour and it busted a bunch up. And that's why I only got a few hundred fish this year. So temperature is a key factor. Now in disease purposes, Temperature also plays a role. If you have sick fish and you have parasites, we may raise the temperature. The only reason we raise the temperature is to speed up that parasite so the medication can work. If you raise the temperature for fungus or bacteria, you're creating stressful conditions and better growing grounds for those organisms. So it's only for parasites and disease that we would raise temperature. And then I know if I have certain problems with fish with viruses, they only come out at certain temperatures. And we cannot treat viruses in fish. It's just not something that we're going to do. pH, and I use this scale quite a bit because, remember, there's negative pHs. There's pHs way above 14 or 15. We talk about a scale from 0 to 14, but it goes all over the place. Most of our fish live between 6.5 and 8.0, 8.2. Most of our fish. We do have rarities. Um, but again, if we look at where the fish is coming from and we can try and match that up, the fish will thrive. And I see us all the time. Um, had somebody the other day set a beautiful cichlid tank up. Got a whole bunch of cichlids. They were so proud. A whole bunch of African cichlids and then those Oscars in there. Now we know that. Okay, Oscars are from the Amazon. They're low pH. But he... And by the way, this was a pet shop that guided this person. So that made it even worse. Okay? But he heard cichlids. So he set up a cichlid tank with high pH. The Oscar will survive, but it will not thrive. And in a short while, that Oscar may get quite large, and the cichlids are going to be food. So again, compatibility. This is one that falls into trouble with people all the time, GH and KH, water hardness. Again, if you look on the right, you'll see different fish. And there's different scales for this. So KH is my buffing capacity. If I'm keeping a saltwater tank, KH, carbonate hardness, is essential for my corals. KH is also essential for my bacteria. Well, you'll see that. My GH is more about the fish, general hardness, calcium and magnesium. If the GH is too high and I have egg layers, those eggshells may get uh, harder than they should, and the fish cannot come out. If they're too soft, it can affect the egg layers as well. So I do play with GH and KH, again, depending on what I'm looking at. When I'm looking at this, remember there's multiple scales, just like there is centigrade and Fahrenheit. On the left column, DKH, Deutsch carbonate hardness, degrees carbonate hardness. And the K comes from the German word, calcium. So DKH, degrees. Mill equivalents per liter and PPM or milligrams per liter on the right. They're all the same thing. It's just a way of converting it differently. So whatever you're working with, and we work with degrees or parts per million here in this country, um, but you can see where they match up. Ammonia and nitrite. These are two issues that... 
People have problems with but don't know it. It's not just when you set the tank up, but when you're keeping fish, when they're breeding, when you're feeding, when you're drastically changing your filter around and disturbing everything. So when you think about the filter, it's a balance between fish food and what your filter capacity can be. And I don't care if it's a sponge filter, a hang on the back, a canister filter, an internal filter. As long as you're circulating water in the tank for the bacteria to function, the bacteria will be converting the ammonia nitrite to nitrate. The only way to know if your tank is in balance is to test it. Now, you don't test it every day. You start out a new tank, you may test it every day or every couple days. But once you're set up, once you're running, once you have a full tank of fish, I don't need to test. My fish look great. They're doing fine. But remember, you have six fish in your tank today. You feed your fish. They're four inches. Next, next year, they're six or eight inches, or one inch to three inches. When a fish doubles in length, it doesn't double in size. It's about ten times in size in body weight and pollution. So the very balance of your tank as your fish grow can be out-kiltered. You may need to increase your filtration. You may need to increase your filtration flow. You may need to clean your filter. Biggest problem with filters is they get dirty. We don't clean them. The nitrifying bacteria cannot grow in a dirty environment. They will not be efficient. But the only way to know is to test it. Simple test. Test your water periodically. Make sure you're where you want to be. The nitrogen cycle hasn't changed. It wasn't around in the 40s and 50s and 60s because we didn't understand it. But we know it. Today, it's a common thing. Fish secrete ammonia. Most of it comes out their gills. 90% of the ammonia in your tank comes from the fish's gills. Not through its feces, not through its urine, but from its gills. You feed the fish high-protein foods. You feed the fish an unbalanced diet. It can't utilize it. It sends the ammonia into the bloodstream and out the gills. The ammonia itself is converted by bacteria to nitrite. Nitrite is then reduced again to nitrate, and the nitrate either accumulates in the tank and is reduced by water changes or taken up by plants. How often to check the water quality? You mean testing. As a, as a fish nerd, I like playing with the test kits. So for me, it's, it's not a big thing at least once a week, once every two weeks. Just make sure you're staying where you want to be. For pH, ammonia, nitrite, and then KH. Those four in particular. pH, ammonia, nitrite, and KH. That's going to tell you if you're going out of kilter. I personally believe KH is one of the most important things to check in a tank because you're going to see that drop and get low before your bacteria start to slow down or before your pH drops. Bacteria primarily need a 100 to 5 to 1 rule. 100 parts of uh, carbon, 5 parts of nitrogen, 1 part of phosphate, and then micronutrients. So my KH is going to help tell me where I'm at in the tank. The question was, what about nitrates? I don't really care that much about nitrates. I mean, it's, it's, it's a challenging thing because high nitrates and high phosphates will tell me that I'm not doing enough water changes. High phosphates and high nitrates might tell me I have an overpolluted tank or I'm feeding too much. But that could also be coming from my water source. When I was at East Stroudsburg, we kept a tank at 1,200 parts per million of nitrate and the fish were fine. They weren't breeding. They weren't as colorful as they should be. So you hear what the magical nitrate number should be. In the wild, it's virtually zero because the plants are utilizing it. Um, you're getting your water flow. But in a home aquarium, you expect some nitrate. You know, you'll find a level. Is it 40 or 60 or wherever it is that when it starts getting above that, you'll see that your tank needs to be cleaned. And when we talk about cleaning the tank, we're talking about siphoning the gravel and doing a partial water change. Um, but you can test for lots of things. Minimal pH, ammonia, nitrite, and KH. So when we're starting out a tank, we're going to see a curve such as this. The dark line is ammonia. The next one's nitrite and then nitrate. To cycle out a new tank or set up a quarantine tank from scratch, 
you're going to be anywhere from four weeks to three months to cycle that sucker out. You don't think how long it can take for a tank to cycle. Now, we can speed it up with bacteria, but I can't stop. I need to go through it. So I can move a balanced filter, a sponge filter or something from one tank to the next. I can keep a hang on the back filter on an established tank, and when I do need a quarantine tank for new fish coming in, fish that just bred, or possibly diseased fish, I can move that filter over with the media and then put a clean filter on the new tank. But when I'm setting up a quarantine tank, I'm taking a piece of my old filtration and moving it if I don't have one already established because I want to move the bacteria with it. I know if I use Quick Start, I can cut whatever time it is in half. If it would take me four weeks to cycle and I use Quick Start, I normally see it happen in two. If it would have taken me two months, I'm going to see Quick Start do it in a month. It normally cuts it in half and keeps the levels really low in the process. If I do have ammonia, we do have things to take care of it. Amalok just detoxifies. It doesn't get rid of it. So if you do have ammonia, make sure you take care of it. On the left is fish cells that were exposed to ammonia. They kind of break apart and the cell walls lose their structure. On the right are fish cells with ammonia that were exposed to the ammonia and amylok at the same time. They continue to function and do just fine. So we know it works. We've proven it through science. Nitrite, same thing. And for nitrite, one of the big things is nitrite goes into the bloodstream, binds with the red blood cells, and suffocates the fish. Where ammonia actually damages the gills, hurts the cell walls. Nitrite has a different way of functioning. But what we can do, the reason we put aquarium salt into our water is to help the fish osmoregulate. Now that's calcium, magnesium, sodium, sulfate, potassium, etc., electrolytes. But also we have a chloride cell on the cell wall that helps passively move ammonia out of the blood, helps move oxygen, etc. So when we have issues with nitrate, we do increase the salt level. So I'm a big believer in aquarium salt for all fish. I don't care what. I use less in a plant tank than I do a cichlid tank, obviously. I put it in my pond at half the dose than I would put it in a pond with water lilies. I use half the dose than I would with koi. So I do play around that way, but I'm a big believer in using aquarium salt with fish. No problem. All the, all the noise about scaleless fish with malachite green or X solutions or things like that, I've never been able to prove that through science. I think it's a cautionary thing because scaleless fish with parasites, because they are scaleless, they're relying simply on a slime coat, are more vulnerable. So they're weaker, thereby when they eventually find them, with the, uh, whether it's velvet or ick or whatever, they're more sensitive. But I don't find scaleless fish to be a problem with salt, malachite, diflubenzeron, or anything of the sort. So a lot of the noise about scaleless fish, I don't believe. I want to find it in science and not hobbyist folklore. I don't want to upset folklore because there's a lot of old guys and gals out there that have done great things breeding fish, and we don't know their science, but they're doing something scientifically right to get those fish to breed. So I don't want to, I don't want to dish that, but no problem with scaleless fish at all. Some of my tropical plants, I'll cut my salt level in half, um, but I still use salt. So disease, remember what I said about disease, it's the fish's inability to um, normally function. We have two types of disease, infection, which is the pathogen, that's your bacterial, fungal, parasitic, or viral, and then we have disease, the abnormal condition characterized by gradual degradation of the fish's ability to maintain normal function. That's your improper pH, that's your temperature that's off, that's nutrition. Again, remember, a very small part of our problem is really pathogens. But that's where everybody wants to go to. If you have a fish that's sick from a, from a pathogen, we need to treat it. But then we need to find out what's wrong. Why did it get sick in the first place? Was it old? Was it beaten up by a tank mate? Have I been feeding it an improper way of feeding it for a long time? And its immune system is dropped. 
Why did it get sick? So I do need the treat for the pathogen, but then I need to go back and find out environmentally or nutritionally or whatever, why was it sick? Because if I treat it for a disease today and don't take care of the cause, I'm going to be treating tomorrow and treating tomorrow. Then I'm going to get frustrated. And then I'm going to tell my friends about my sick fish. And then my friends aren't going to want to have fish tanks. Sound familiar? And, you know, there's two times that people complain about their tanks. It's when their fish keep getting sick and when their most expensive fish died. So other than that, people love their tanks. But if we correct the problem to begin with, we won't be using the medications. We sell a lot of medications, but that's not our goal. And there are times where they're needed, and we talk about these infections. Remember where we're at and separate infectious from non-infectious. You need to know the type of fish you have. You need to know what's normal to know what's abnormal. If you come home and your favorite fish is sitting on the gravel, it's just laying there, it's not moving, you can barely see it breathing, do you feel good? If your favorite fish is a gold spot pleco? Okay, it's normal for a pleco to sit on the gravel. It's not normal for a danio to sit on the gravel. So again, you gotta be careful with some of the descriptions. Nutrition. My big pet peeve is buying giant things of food and keeping them around for six months or nine months. The first thing to leave food is vitamins. Food gets rancid, improper proteins, things of like that sort. But the first thing to leave food is vitamins. If we don't have the proper vitamins in our nutritional diet to the fish, we're going to have problems. The rest of the food can be great. The protein, the fiber, the fat, the moisture, the ash, everything else is great. But if we're lacking the vitamins, we're going to get hemorrhaging. We're going to get scoliosis of the spine. We're going to get anemia. We're going to get cloudy eyes. These are just some examples of what deficiency does to fish for vitamins. The other factor is if we feed a whole lot of protein into the tank, we're not helping the fish. Now, I grant you, fry, young fish can take higher protein during their growing points. But as a fish grows, it slows down, and the protein should as well. If I feed high protein, it's just going to come out the gills, and I'm going to pollute the tank. So... High levels of protein are not great. Too low a levels, there's a magic number. Um, so obviously every manufacturer puts a Best Buy date on it. Once you open that container, once you break that seal, I really would like to see it used in 30 days to 90 days. Okay? Three to six months max. And think about this. Would you open a bag of potato chips, put it on the counter, eat some, go on vacation for a week, come home and say, look at those potato chips, they've been open for a week, I'm going to continue to eat them. Sounds silly, doesn't it? Would you put a good quality meal unwrapped in your fridge and eat it five days later and think it's good? Probably not. The thing that destroys fish food is heat and humidity. Where do we keep our fish food? On top of our fish tanks. What's there? Heat and humidity. It's common sense. When you get your food, if you're buying food and it's a deal, break it into some Ziploc bags, put it in a cool, dry area, put it in the fridge, put it in the freezer, I don't care. But break it into smaller portions. Buy smaller containers so you can use them up. Get your containers sealed and keep your, put your money in the right place. Buy a good quality food in small amounts, feed it, keep your fish healthy. So, you know, in our foods, we add two different things which are unique. We add zeolite, clintophile, um, to help with the ammonia in the blood. We also do bound amino acids. So there's three amino acids lacking in food, uh, methionine, lysine, and threonine. Threonine is very unique to fish because it's a slime coat. 
Um, and it doesn't matter how much fish meal or shrimp meal or squid meal or whatever I put into my foods. Those are the three amino acids that are always lacking. In order to get the right amount, I've got to increase the amount of fish meal or whole fish or whatever. And there's all those games about whole fish or half fish or fish meal or this or that. It doesn't matter. But the point is, when we're talking about the food, in order to get the right 10 amino acids into the fish, I'd have to provide too much fish meal to get the amino acids and the rest would go out their gills. So we found the proprietary way to bind those to the proteins to get the right balance. We've proven it through science. Again, we provide the methods, we provide the experiments, we provide the results. Um, so we know that we have less ammonia, cleaner water, clearer water because of it. So when you think about the food, the science is there. And this, Don, this is one of Donna's formulas. Uh, Don is a PhD fish nutritionist. She's uh, been doing it for, well, I'll get in trouble if I say her age, um, but uh, 20 plus years. Um, and, uh, you know, it's, it's something that we've evolved into as well. Now, remember, Mars has been doing fish food for 50 years with a top selling fish food in the UK, which is aquarium. We're the only place where number one is the UK. Everywhere else, we're chasing the big leader. We know. But we put the science behind it. So when I, when I put this together, this is something I use to think about disease organisms. Your fish are living with disease organisms all the time. You are not keeping your fish in a sterile environment. Your fish are fighting off every day those disease organisms through their slime coat, through their immune system, through their health. If I have a dirty tank, the fish are exposed to more of the uh, diseased organisms. And the first one here, if I'm not feeding it right, its immune system drops, and it can't fight off the organisms that are in the tank anyway. On the one on the right, the far right, if I have a dirty tank, that increases the breeding ground for the diseased organisms and the healthy fishes is pounded and pounded and pounded. Worst case scenario, I don't feed right, I have a dirty tank, I'm going to lose my fish. The idea is on the far right, keep your tanks clean, keep your fish healthy. Its natural immune system is going to fight off that disease just fine. Not, not super scientific stuff here. So we talk about a dirty tank, we're talking about controlling the organic matter the debris, the slime, the mulm, the debris in the bottom of the tank. In nature, rains come through and wash out the lakes. In nature, the plants uptake nutrients. In nature, we don't have these issues. Hydrogen sulfide and methane gas, that comes when we have real thick planted tanks and we don't disturb the gravel. And then one day we rip a plant out and wonder why our fish die. I've done it. I had some fish that were... Um, some rainbows from the wild that were given to me. I had them for a number of years. My wife and I were going out to dinner that night. And you know how it is. Just before you go, you're going to do one thing to your tank. Well, I had a big back area, very thick, and I moved a plant. I learned this lesson the hard way. I ran around like a maniac. We didn't get to dinner that night. My wife puts up with the fish nerds of America. That's us. She calls us fish nerds of America. Um, in a, I'm sure, a nice way. But, uh, you know, I was heartbroken because I knew better. We all do it. So cleaning that gravel, getting that gravel loose. Now when I do plant tanks, I keep all my plants with them crazy runners in pots and then put the gravel over the pot so the uh, valisneria or any of my crypts or whatever just run around the pot. And then when I want to replant them, I pull them out and thin the pots out so my pots are below the gravel. You don't see them from the outside, but they're there. Uh, but that benthic area, that organic area, that's a primary area for my ciliated protozoans, for my bacteria, for my things. I keep that clean, I'm not going to have a problem. Easiest way to do it is physically remove it through siphon. When you do your water change, siphon the gravel. Between cleanings, we can use enzymatic cleanup bacteria to reduce it further. Stress siphon has been shown to reduce aromonas and pseudomonas in the gravel through competitive inhibition. So this is what bacteria look like on the left. I don't know if you've ever seen them in the picture form. That's exactly what they look like. Um, but uh, we know that 
we can use the cleanup bacteria, the enzymatic bacteria to get after these things, and we've proven it. That buildup of debris also drops my pH. That buildup of debris also competes for oxygen. So using the cleanup bacteria is just getting after them, but you cannot do this in place of siphoning and doing water changes. Absolutely essential. I talk about the mucus and the slime coat on fish. When you net a fish, when fish are breeding, when fish are competitively fighting for territory, they're pulling, they're fighting slime off each other, they're pulling scales off. That's when we're most vulnerable. We know that we can enhance the slime coat, we can help that damaged tissue, and that's one of the benefits of stress coat. But important thing, if your fish are fighting, if your fish are uh, um, either fighting for territory or breeding, remember, that they are damaging each other's skin. And it's that open skin area that's going to be vulnerable to disease. So when you're looking at your fish, we know what to look for. If they're gasping at the surface, if it's a solid, if it's a schooling fish and it's all solitary in the corner, flashing, flashing is parasites in almost all cases. Remember what flashing is. When the fish goes up and scratches against a rock, when it scratches against the gravel. Now, I'm not talking about looking at my 150-gallon tank and seeing a fish here or a fish there. If I'm looking out in the room and I, I see Tom scratch his ear, I'm not getting upset. I see Tom keep scratching through the whole seminar, I'm going to the other side of the room. <laughs> Two different things here. So when we talk about a fish flashing, it comes from ponds. Remember, fish are normally dark on top, silver on the bottom for parasite purposes. So when a predatory fish is below it looking up, the light color blends in with the sky. When there's a heron or some other kingfisher or some predator at the top looking down, the fish blends with the bottom. But when it scratches against something, that underbelly catches the sun, and then we see flashing. So behavioral signs. Um, look for what's normal. Know what the fish looks like normally, and when it's abnormal is when we have to react. Physical signs, open red sores, swollen abdomen, Popeye, etc. The fish in the top right, we uh, had in, got in from a pet shop, and it was treated with Melifix when we were developing it. It completely healed, grew back, and the fins came back really well, which is one of the unique things about Melifix because we can see them get normal fin growth. Um, where if I treat with antibiotics, I sometimes don't get the same finage back. But the interesting thing is, because its immune system picked up, the pigmentation changed in that fish dramatically. It picked up blacks and reds that weren't there. So remember, a sick fish being stressed is also going to lose color. So when you heal a sick fish, it's not uncommon to see it. Our goal is not treatment, but prevention. I'm going to talk a little bit about treatment here, but I don't want to do treatment. I want to do prevention. We talk about treatment. Remember non-infectious problems, temperature, fighting, incompatibility, nutritional, etc. But then we have parasitic, bacterial, fungal, and viral. We are not going to talk about viral. I have no way to treat viruses today in small ornamental fish. Parasites. Most common is ciliated protozoans, uh, the parasites that move around, chomp around, or whatever. When we're treating ciliated protozoans, especially ick, we can only treat it during a small part of its life cycle. So the reason we would raise the temperature and then treat it with a disease is to get it through the life cycle and get the medication to work at the right time. But if I have a fish with ick, I have to say, why did it get ick in the first place? Ick is like you getting a cold. It's always in the tank. You're never going to get rid of it. Just think that way, unless you're buying naive fish and keeping a lab. I go to Crozier Medical Center and the cancer units. Yes, they keep zebrafish. They buy them naive. They put them in the room. Nothing has ever been exposed to them. But that's not the way we're working with fish. We're buying fish from pet shops that are infiltrated with disease. We're bringing them home into our tanks, which have all kinds of disease. How many of us have had a tank for two years, didn't enter a fish, and then all of a sudden, ick popped up? Right? I see Brian back there saying, yeah, I get it all the time. 
So whether it's low temperature or immune drop, and then the fish disease. Uh, if I'm looking at fungus, I always treat fungus as a secondary infection, not primary. That means I have an underlying cause. Fungus needs damaged tissue to invade. That's fish fighting. That's a bacterial infection. That's the fish breeding and scraping against a rock with damaged tissue. So if I have fungus, I'll treat the fungus and then say, what's my underlying cause? Anytime you have fungus, always look for a secondary cause, not the primary. With one exception on the far left, mouth fungus. Mouth fungus on fish is normally a bacterial infection, not a fungus infection. So if you have fungus on the mouth, it's actually truly a bacterial infection that looks like fungus. If it's white cottony growth on the fins or the bodies or things, it's true fungus, saprolignia or achela. Most all the back, the question was, is that gram negative or gram positive? It is a gram negative. Most all the bacteria we're treating are gram negative. Um, don't get too hung up on gram negative or gram positive unless you're going to culture the bacteria out, which we're not going to have time for in the aquarium. By the time we culture it out, our fish is dead. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a second with antibiotics. Um, bacterial infections, again, gram negative, gram positive. Gram negative, the gram stain, they put it in to the bacteria. It doesn't pick up the stain. It's kind of pink. Gram positive, it comes up dark. That's where gram negative and gram positive. It's, it's different of the cell walls. The cell structures are different. It's whether it picks up stain or doesn't pick up stain. Thereby, the belief is gram negative and gram positive also have a way that they pick up and affect different antibiotics. And we do have some antibiotics that work on some diseases and not others, et cetera. But I try not to use antibiotics. I sell lots of them. I have a whole bunch of antibiotics, all different ones. We have erythromycin, we have Furan 2, we have TC, we have Fin and Body Cure. Uh, we have Gen well, General Cure is not an antibiotic, but it, um, it's praziquantel and metronidazole. But I saw antibiotics, but I say I try not to use antibiotics. When I use an antibiotic in an aquarium, it will treat the disease, but it also drops the immune system of the fish. When you take an antibiotic yourself, you're affecting your microflora in your intestine, your stomach, and everything else. So if you can use a medication that's going to boost your immune system and naturally fight it off, or use something more natural that's going to fight before an antibiotic, that's where I try and go. There are times where antibiotics are the, cause, are the right answer. Um, so when we talk about bacterial infections, these are open red sores, cloudy eyes, frayed fins, et cetera, et cetera. They can be internal or external. When we see these, we have to get after them. Because by the time the fish is visibly showing a bacterial infection, it's normally systemic. It's normally through its whole system. Remember, all infections, especially bacteria, are opportunistic. They're always there. A healthy fish is going to fight it off. And if we have a dirty tank, we're just breeding these things. So I show this because this brings me to the antibiotics. We have those people that like to be all natural, and those people like to have just, you know, those that like to play with the chemistry or whatever the case may be. There's no right or wrong answer here. Whether you're playing on the right or playing on the left, a medication that works is a medication that works. We came up with Melofix a number of years ago. It took us seven years to get this product to market. Melolukakajaputi. We tried a bunch. We, we hoped, you, this is in the eucalyptus family. We hoped eucalyptus would work. We hoped true tea tree, Meluca altinifolia, would work because it was cheaper. Didn't. Meluca cachaputti worked. And it's the way we emulsified. If we just poured it directly in the tank, it would just float on the surface. The first fish, some of the first fish that were looked at that it was working on, we didn't believe. We had a silver dollar, which was more of a pet fish of the day in the fish room than anything else. We'd gotten from a pet shop, the fins, that dorsal fin was completely down to the nubs, nothing there. Pectoral fins were barely there. The thing could barely swim around. It was in a tank by itself so it wouldn't get beat up. And we did everything under the sun for years, you know, antibiotic-wise or whatever. And Clara, uh, Clara Salati, uh, retired from us now. I just actually saw her yesterday, actually. But Clara put some Melaleuca Catch, put the 
emulsified into the tank, and this fish started to grow fins. So there was a systemic infection or a problem on that fish that just kept those fins from growing, and we actually didn't believe it. But seven years to get this to market because it was so unique in its time. It's an antibacterial. It also boosts the immune system, and it promotes tremendous fissure, fish, tissue regrowth in about four days. Very unique for a medication. If this were an antibiotic, and this were on their gas chromatograph, the GC, you'd see one spike. So if this were erythromycin, we'd see a spike right about here. One spike. Think of it this way. If you're going down the road, and you want to get somewhere, and you were going, and the bridge is out, you're going to make a left and go over another bridge and keep going. There's ways resistant bacteria, bacteria that can get around an antibiotic. 43 different active peaks with Melaleuca. That means if you're going down the road and you're trying to get somewhere, 43 different pathways to get there are out. Very hard to get around. Pimifix is pimenta racemosa, also antibacterial, works internally as well as externally, and works on fungus. Doesn't boost the immune system, doesn't promote tissue regrowth the way Melifix does in four days, but they're both antibacterial. So people say, which should I use? Yes, you can use them together. Yeah, great, that's not the answer. Which should I use? I can't tell you that. If you say, which antibiotic should I use? I have frayed fins or I have an open red sore. I can't tell you that unless I culture out the bacterias, and you won't have time for that. So a few years ago, if you had asked me about Furan 2, I would have said, forget it. The fish farmers have used it too much. It's not working as well. Use TC. Today, Furan 2 is working great because fish farmers have backed off it a little bit again. So depending on what they're culturing, what's coming in from the wild, what we're seeing in the pet shops, you'll have different antibiotics or different medications that work differently. Malifix is my first go-to because it boosts the immune system. It treats more bacterial infections than most antibiotics. I'm going to go to Malifix or Pimifix before my antibiotics because of the reasons I said. I don't want to drop their immune system. I don't want to put any stress on the tank. Again, Pimifix having multiple peaks on the way it works. So remember, when we talk about naturals, we have many synergistic active compounds in them. My antibiotics are a single source. They work, but they're a single source. There's a potential for resistance. It does stress the life of the fish. It means it's microflora. It can stress your biological filter. It lowers their immune system. My, my naturals don't do that. So I sell both. We have both. But people always want to know which should they treat with. I, my my go-to is the naturals for the reasons I'm saying. And when I talk about tissue regrowth and regrowing back, when I use, uh, we have spines and rays in our fins. Rays are a soft tissue. Spines are more like a hard bone, but not actually. Uh, when they grow back, especially the rays, after an infection with antibiotics, I often get crooked or a little abnormality in it. When I use Melifix and Pimifix, I don't get it. They kind of grow back really nice, comparatively. It also works on corals. Now, Melifix might work on corals, because when Melifix and Pimifix are used together, they're also antiparasitic. So it might be working on corals actually treating parasites. We don't know. We actually don't know. Um, so in short, remember, clean water, control the organics in your tank, feed properly, and by all means, give your fish room to swim. I can't stress that enough. Do your water changes. The solution to pollution is dilution. If I can't get anything else in your head tonight, I want to get that there. Do your water changes. Testing is the only way you're going to know water quality. You know, keep a notebook. Write things down. We have a new water testing unit out. It's a spin test. I have it in about four stores 
I have it only in four stores right now. I'm putting it with some service companies and we're expanding it. It's been going great. I'm looking forward to that because that's giving me data back. I personally believe that we're going to find from this data, from hundreds and hundreds of hobbyists, that we have a bigger problem out there with cage. And cage is a canary. It's an indicator of what's going to happen in the tank better than anything else. That's my soapbox. I want to prove it. I want to prove it through science. Not everybody's in line with me. I could be wrong. But the only way I know that is through recording it in notebooks. Yep. KH. What's KH? Thank you, sir. KH. Carbonate hardness. So remember in our hardness, there's GH, general hardness, and KH, carbonate hardness. So I, I use acronyms and terms all the time. And to me, they're in my vocabulary. So when I do things like that, kick me, please do. Um, but yeah, a way of testing. And then um, non-lethal issues that you don't think much about, hitting that tap water and just topping the tank off, scratching the fish to hitting a few gills will have long-term effects. So again, feed properly. Routine maintenance is key. And what's the bottom say? Thank you. And uh, so if you have any questions, let me know. I'll be happy to answer them. But Yes. The question is, is Malefix and Pemafix safe for axolotls and snails? Yes. Safe in salt water, fresh water. I found no issues with it whatsoever. Regular strength, absolutely. Yep, absolutely. So, well, thank you. Yes. Question is, how often should the test kit be replaced? All of our test kits have expiration dates on them. The way you store them will matter. Storing them on a sunny shelf is going to degrade them faster. When you're doing test kits, you should hold the bottle completely upside down, not on its side to get a full drop. We kind of counter for that a little bit. But uh, use the expiration dates. They are real. GH and KH is a three-year dead drop-off. When it hits that three years, you go three years and six months, you're not getting a real answer. Uh, nitrite's another one. Uh, pH probably will last you longer than the expiration date for low-range pH. High-range pH, again, is a dead. So there is expiration dates on there. There's also dip strips and liquids. I like, li I like the liquid kits. The droppers are a lot better than those dip strips. Dip strips are fast, convenient, and give you an answer. But I can get a lot more precision. I can read 65, 68, 69, 70 with a liquid. I can't do that with a dip strip. But they're both going to give you an answer. They're both going to be correct. I can just get a better vision with my liquids. I will tell you that we've done the testing against the top competitors, and we definitely have cleaner, clearer water. We definitely have 30% less ammonia coming out of the fish with our food, comparatively, fish weight for fish weight. Um, I know the science. Uh, we do a complete and balanced diet with vitamins and minerals. We've been challenged by states. I've presented our science to the states. They've accepted it, didn't. And I asked them, I says, okay, why'd you pick on us? And not, you know, have you ever challenged another competitor? No. Why'd we, oh, you got turned in. Okay. But now you go check the others. Um, very proud of our foods. Very proud of our foods. Um, and that's, again, due to Donna and the work that Donna and Tim and Lewis and our team have done. And I've done the testing here. And of course, we do the testing in England as well. We really do continuously test the food. Um, Luton is being outlawed in Europe in July of 20... It has to be off the market by 2019. It has to be out by 2018. Um, that's a colorant in food uh, for the fish, luton, a carotenoid. We already have you know, done the science and prepared for that change. So when, this, when the regulators are on top of things, we were the first to prove marigold colors fish. It's only legal for use in chickens. It colors the skin of chicken. That's how Purdue gets that nice chicken skin color, is marigold. Um, we did the work. It also does a great carotenoid, a great colorant for fish. Attractants for fish, uh, things for fish that you wouldn't think about. Anise, 
grapeseed, things of this sort, or attractants for fish. Um, there are all kinds. Of, we look at that. We want to make sure the fish, the food is palatable, is the right size for the mouth, has the right feel. We want to make sure it has the attractant because if they don't ingest it, they can't digest it. Uh, so we do all that work, and we do it continuously, and we don't stop. Is food still made here in the States? Yes, absolutely. Yep. Well, we still make food in the UK. Aquarians made in the UK. Aquarian pellets are made here. And all of our foods are made here. Shelf life on enzyme. Enzyme actually turns into a spore. So enzyme has a shelf life of five years. Quick start also has a shelf life. Um, and they're all marked on their packaging. So it's three to five years minimum for any product we make. Quick start is a living bacteria. It does not develop a spore. Where stress time is five different bacteria, all bacillus, and they all develop spores, so they have very long shelf life. But it is five years from the date we manufacture. We do put some preservatives and things in there, and we do put them into a dilution that keeps them that way. Um, but yeah, it is definitely a shelf life. It's not going to hurt if you use it after it, uh, but there is a real shelf life to it. We guarantee the number of bacteria we deliver at five years. It's much higher the first year. Ways to determine for boosting the immune system. One of the things we measure is stress. We actually measure cortisol. Uh, we also can look at blood antigens and things of this sort. There's a numerous different ways to measure the immune system of fish. We can also measure slime coat um, as an indication of health. So we know that if we're improving the fish's health, and the resistance to disease. So there's numerous ways to do immune, depending on the protocol of the experiment. The question was, what's the right percentage of water to change, and how often? Is it 10% or 90%? Some of your discus people will change 90%. Some people will say 10%. Some people say don't change anything. You know, use this product, you don't have to change water for six months. I work with nature, I work with science. Um, the answer is not that clear because it depends on how much pressure you're putting on the water, how many fish you have, and what the pollution level is. So as a general rule, I like to see about 20%, at least once a month, preferably every two weeks. I'm not afraid to do more. I'm not worried about the bacteria. Nitrifying bacteria can be free swimming. They can be in the water. They can be on the gravel. They can be on the glass. They can be in media. So you're not going to shear off or wash away the bacteria. I'm not worried about that. Um, I'd rather get you to change water more often, keep the gravel clean, and test the water. But um, I'm not afraid to do 90% if the water coming in is correct. If the water coming in is bad, then it's even worse. So I'm not giving you a definitive answer because I can't but I like to see about 25% at a time. Don't know the definitive answer. So she's talking about methohemoglobin. That's when the nitrites are high. It binds with the red blood cells, and the fish can no longer transfer as much oxygen. Because it binds with the red blood cell and the fish is stressed for oxygen, we want to get the gills functioning better, thus the aquarium salt, and the fish will produce new red blood cells. So does it cleave off and do it? I don't know. That's, I'd have to pull a fish physiology book out. It's been too many years. The question was, how long can you keep food of ours or anybody's um, in the refrigerator? Um, I wouldn't want to see it kept longer than a year once it's opened and put out there. Um, all kinds of scenarios, the better the seal, the longer, etc. There's not a magical answer unless you know the oxidative factor of the material, temperature, etc. But your question was, how long do I like to see you keep it once you open it and put it in smaller containers or whatever in the fridge? I'd say about a year max, um, and that's pushing it. 